Prabhupada. Greetings, everyone. My name is Wayne Jennings, and I want to personally welcome you to our, to our forum today. Our special Earth Day forum is titled Stories from Gra Gasland, and this will be of great interest to all of us right now. I'd like to now introduce the coordinator for today's forum, Debbie Wright, who will <coughs> introduce the topic and our speakers. Debbie? Greetings and welcome to our forum today. Sadly, this is our last forum for the winter spring season 2021. We will be back in September 2021. At that time, we may be meeting in person, but we are exploring ways to continue to have our an online presence. We appreciate your continued support during this unique time. We appreciate your patience as we've all learned to work with new technology. We also appreciate your participation in these forums. Your great questions help make this forum series so interesting. A little housekeeping before we get started. In the near future, if you are on our mailing list, you will be receiving a survey asking you to evaluate the forums you have listened to, and we would like your suggestions for future forums. If you're not on our email list and you would like to be on our email list, put your name and email in the chat. Remember, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not in the chat. My name is Debbie Wright. As Unitarian Universalists, we organize these forums as a congregational service to the community um, to support personal growth and reflection social action, and to encourage individual and collective growth for all who attend. Our forum today is Earth Day Stories from Gasland. What is it like to live over a gas fracking well or near an injection well? We chose today's topic because climate change is happening. Our planet is getting measurably warmer. High record temperatures are being recorded. Jap Japan just recorded its earliest cherry blossom season in 1,200 years. Scientists agree that extractive carbon energy, coal, oil, and gas are leading contributors to climate change. But how do we decrease our use of this convenient form of energy? It is cheap for consumers, but costly for the planet and costly for those who work and live where coal, oil, and gas are extracted from the ground. Most of us are old enough to remember dirty coal, but clean gas. But even gas is a high price for the planet for those who live near the wells. What will it take to change the way we power and heat our homes and businesses? It will not be easy, there will be pain, and maybe these stories will help us find a reason to change. I will now introduce this morning's forum speakers. We have two speakers. We will take questions after their presentation. And remember to put your questions in the Q&A, found someplace on your screen, top or bottom, usually depending on your device. Our first speaker will be Ted Ock, PhD. Um, he's with the Great Lakes Program Director for Tracker. Um, track, Frack Tracker, some of this makes me stutter, I'm sorry. Frack Tracker Alliance is a 501 nonprofit that shares maps, images, data, and analysis related to the oil and gas industry, hoping that a better informed public will be able to make better informed decisions regarding the world's energy future. He is a PhD from the University of Vermont his primary interest is in frac sand mining, watershed security and resilience, food energy nexus, and oil and gas waste production, transport, and disposal. He has been working for Frack Tracker for eight years on fracking's impact. He is also on the board of directors for FACT, that's Faith Communities Coming Together for a Sustainable Future. Our second speaker will be Debbie Cowden, MD. She received her MD from Wright State University in Dayton. She practiced family medicine for 10 years in Oklahoma, where she treated patients who had worked in the oil fields. Now she, um, now she is a resident of Loudonville in Ashland County. After returning to Ohio, uh, Dr. Calvin worked in public health in Richland and Knox counties. Soon after returning to Ohio, her household received a letter inviting them to lease their land for gas extraction. This made gas extraction personal. She is on the board of directors for FACT. She is the director of the Ohio Health Project of FACT. Since 2016, they have been collecting baseline health profiles and longitudinal health updates from people living near fracking wells to document the health impact of those living near these fracking wells. Ted, it's your turn to talk. <laughs> Great, thank you. Thank you, Debbie. 
uh, and thanks for having us here today. Um, I'm going to have a little bit of a PowerPoint, but it's all images, as my wife likes to say. Don't bore people with figures and graphs, so I'm not going to do that today. That's my kind of wheelhouse. But more to the point of Debbie's introduction, um, as I as she said, I've been working at Frag Tracker for about eight and a half years now, and uh, we do what I think is pretty good work in identifying the data gaps and filling those gaps in when we can as it relates to fracking's impacts. And more importantly, understanding the, the, the depth and breadth of what it is that fracking has brought and wrought to Appalachia. And for me personally, um, I do a lot of work up in Wisconsin on sand mining as well, which is integral to the fracking process. So the big question that I've been asking for eight years is, you know, what is the, what is the total impact of fracking from a water waste and landscape impact? But more recently, I thought to myself, and regarding Debbie's point about pain, you know, the long-term pain or the short-term pain of transitioning to renewals, I thought to myself, you know, these people have experienced pain for decades and decades, whether it's the coal boom bus, the timber boom bus, you name it. This Appalachia, where I work quite extensively, has been experiencing pain day to day. Uh, and I've thought to myself, you know, where I live, I live up here in Shaker Heights, where I'm sure a lot of you live here as well. And I feel like I straddle that line a lot. And I hear from my friends around here about issues related to renewables and, you know, what it would cost and the logistical issues around it. But what I think to myself is I spend so much time in Appalachia and I see what those people have endured. And I think to myself, we need to kind of put some equity in the, in the, in the game, too, as well, up here in these urban communities. And that's going to involve pain. It's going to involve huge price fluctuations and spikes in energy as we go there. But I can tell you from my experiences the last couple of years that these people that I'm going to talk to you about today have been experiencing this constantly. So they, you know, the industrial boom that we've had in this country and the, the, the might that we have in terms of GDP was, was happened on the backs of Appalachia and cheap energy. So um, I thought to myself in the last couple of years, what I really need to do is start to fill in the gap in the human condition and how it's been altered by fracking. We do a lot of data and you know what we find, what we call data are spreadsheets and maps and this, that, the other thing, but data is also the stories. And it's kind of aggregating the stories to tell the greater story about the impacts of fracking. And, and so I, I hope to kind of give that to you here today. Um, if I can, maybe I'm gonna share, um, can oh, share my screen here, okay. I'm going to share my screen here, folks. Um, this is the new normal for everyone. Um, and I'm going to start this off, start this presentation off. Um, can you all see that? Um, so I'm going to start my presentation off with this slide. Um, and this slide right here is an image that um, is an image that I took with my drone several years ago. Uh, uh, this is a compressor station complex in Powhatan Point, uh, Ohio, right on the Ohio River. Uh, you can see what's happened at this site is basically mountaintop removal for gas, comp for gas um, transport and processing. But the reason that this image is important is because in the top left, you can see what looks like a, a grass strip. Um, and that grass strip uh, Lee, is a gathering pipeline that's being a gas pipeline that's fed into this complex and fed down into the Ohio River Valley further and further until the processing is complete. But right adjacent to that grass strip on the top left of this image is Alan Young's house. Alan Young is a uh, corrections officer in West Virginia. Uh, his father, his father-in-law is a coal uh, truck driver. And he, um, the two of them, I met them three or four years ago because I was in, down in the area researching and trying to better understand the impacts of an Exxon uh, frack pad explosion from the people that lived adjacent to it. So not only does this family live next to this complex, but they experienced a pretty traumatic event uh, as it relates to fracking uh, the pad itself. But what I wanted to show you with this image is, is that fracking is just not a pad. It's not, uh, it's not a waste disposal site. It's all of the above, and it includes very heavy industrial activities across central Appalachia. And Alan Young and his father-in-law, I met them, as I said, three years ago. Uh, we were in their woodshed just talking about what it's been like. And I walked away from that conversation saying to myself, you know, you really should have recorded that. You should have documented that conversation. Because what I learned from these gentlemen who don't even have high school diplomas was a, it was a masterclass 
in understanding the impacts of fracking and energy in Appalachia. Alan Young has since moved because he could not deal with the noise and the light pollution and the flaring that came off of this pad. Um, he moved, I think last fall sometime. So he moved closer to the corrections facility, which brought he and his wife further away from her father. Um, so that was a you know, pretty traumatic event for them on multiple levels. But this site right here is, is indicative of what fracking means. Uh, and that's, that's a critical point with this image. Um, this next image right here is a map of basically the central Midwest. Uh, and the, the little red uh, uh, areas that you see right there, those are surveyed areas that I've done some extensive surveying of, of folks as it relates to fracking's impacts. And some of you might say, well, where, how has fracking impacted Illinois? How has it in fact in, impacted Michigan or Wisconsin? Well, as I said at the outset, frack sand mining, the mining of sand to service the shale gas industry in North Dakota and central Appalachia has been critical to the propping up of this industry. I like to say that the fracking industry is analogous to the military industrial complex in the sense that it has its tentacles everywhere in the United States. Uh, and that's growing, those tentacles are growing. So this is kind of the serve area that we've been looking at for you know, three or four years now. Um, this is more of a survey that's, that's closer to what, what you all are familiar with. You can see here on the top left, the insert uh, shows Cuyahoga County and Pittsburgh and Columbus. And then you can also see the Appalachian, central Appalachian counties that we've surveyed in, the, in that insert there. But what you can also see with a greater map is all these green dots are producing oil and gas wells, and all of the orange dots are class two waste disposal wells. So what we have in Ohio, which is un quite unfortunate, is our governor and our elected officials have decided that not only are we going to try to get gas out of the ground, we're going to pump a whole bunch of nasty fracking waste back into the ground. Uh, and that those wells happen quite often right next to people. Um, and the first story that I'd like to tell you is the story of a woman named Michelle Garman, who lives right next to a class two injection well in Vienna, Ohio. I don't have any images of that site because she also lives next to the Youngstown Airport, so you can't put drones up there. So I've never photographed that site, but I've met with Michelle quite a bit in the last couple of years. I actually was just on the phone with her yesterday for a project we're working on. And Michelle Garman is an amazing woman, uh, but what has happened to her by way of the waste disposal of the fracking waste, most of that waste that's come into the site next to her house is actually from Pennsylvania. So you have the cross state flow of nasty fracking waste all over the place. Most of what's happened to her has been constant truck traffic, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with the peak hours being 5 p.m. to 6 a.m., as she told us yesterday. So you imagine air brakes and a whole bunch of nasty trucks coming in and out near your adjacent to your property. As she said, she lives a she lives a long Tom Brady touchdown pass away from this site. So it's right next to her. And she actually, she has assigned some of the, the proximity of this site to her and her husband as one of the reasons why her husband left. So this is having huge traumatic tolls on people. Um, and kind of another thing that we actually are seeing right now is we have a friend uh, down in Belmont County, Ohio, which is, um, which as you can see here in this, in this image is that, that, that dark brown uh, polygon straight in the middle of the Ohio part that I'm talking about, where all of the fracking has been happening the last couple of years along with Monroe County. We have a friend, friend down there named Judy Berger. Judy and her husband <clears throat> live next to a class two uh, injection well that is being constructed right now. Uh, Judy has been going through two years of this, fighting this injection well. Um, and what has happened is she has actually, she's basically had it. She can't deal with it anymore. And she's moving to be with her daughter down in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and this is a huge toll that this has taken on her and her, um, her family. So th these class two waste disposal sites are integral to the fracking process. The oil and gas industry relies on cheap waste and cheap waste disposal. Uh, and most of that's happening in Ohio. So what we're doing in Ohio is we are, we are um, subsidizing basically the oil and gas sector in Pennsylvania and West Virginia because we are not demanding that those states and their operators more efficiently process their waste. And in so doing, we're seeing more and more fracking waste coming into Ohio 
and we're seeing more and more proposals for these sites nearer and nearer to higher population density um, uh, environments. Uh, we, we have the Martins Ferry Austin Master site down in, as I said, Mar Martins Ferry, which is adjacent to a high school football field. Uh, the, the, the stories go on and on. But class two waste disposal and its proximity to people has been a huge, huge problem in this state. Um, so what I want to kind of impress upon the audience here today is, is a lot of these waste disposal sites are coming closer and closer to where you all live, not necessarily Cuyahoga County per se, but Portage County, Geauga County, Ashtabula County is a huge, huge player in the class two waste disposal sites all around Columbus, but not in Columbus. So the trend that you notice is, is that a lot of these urban areas have been fighting fracking in other places um, and preventing it from coming into their place. But what you have to understand is just because you're fighting it in your place doesn't mean it's not happening someplace else. Uh, and doesn't mean that your natural gas sources aren't relying on this kind of thing because they absolutely are. So again, the pain that's being, uh, that, that, that's happening to these people, uh, you know, it's just, the list goes on. Um, but Judy Berger is an example of someone who's just had it after two years, she's leaving. Michelle will not leave her house. This is where she raised her kids. She's not moving. Um, but you know, I wouldn't blame her if she did. But when folks move out of these sites, what you have to understand is they're not getting compensated. They can't get rid of those parcels. So when you have something like this coming next door to you, good luck getting rid of it for fair market value. And good luck getting the operators to compensate you or the states to do the state in Ohio to do anything for you. Um, this is a, anyway, this is that image again, but I kind of, I like to show this image because there's another story that I'd like to tell associated with this site. And that's a man named Larry Vuselich. Larry Vuselich was the head of the United Mine Workers in Ohio for a bunch of years. He's now retired. He lives right down the street from the Youngs that I told you about. So uh, maybe a couple hundred yards uh, east of this image or, or left of the image as you look at it. Um, Larry Vuselich, is an, he's an amazing guy. Uh, I got to know him a couple of years ago when I was trying to understand the impacts of fracking on this, this watershed down there called Captina Creek. Uh, Larry, as I said, he's, uh, he's, not, he's not a political activist. He's not someone who overly involves himself in that kind of stuff, but he's grown increasingly frustrated with our state and with how our state has been handling this industry. And he likes to tell me that this site right here across the holler from where he lives this site has one person operating it permanently, remotely. So the idea that fracking is some sort of job generator is what Larry likes to kind of point out. And he's, he's under no illusions that coal is some sort of uh, bridge fuel. He's under no illusions that coal is the most safe thing in the world. But what he likes to say is, is he lists all the mines that he had miners in, and he gives me the numbers for the number of uh, uh, man hours put into those mines over time. And he likes to contrast it with the fracking industry where most of the labor that we have in Ohio that does a lot of this stuff is either working remotely or migrates with the pads. These are not people that live in Ohio. Uh, oftentimes they come from states like Oklahoma, uh, New Mexico and the like where the industry knows their labor force and they like to keep a known quantity moving around and that's what you end up ha ha having happened. Um, this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is rough. Um, this is probably the story that um, probably moved me the most. Um, this is the Guernsey natural gas power plant that's under construction right now. Um, and, uh, you know, what do I want to say about this? I want to say that I met Kevin and Marlene Young, who live at the way left of this image. You can see that little roundish oval on the way left. That's their, that's their racetrack. That's their horse track. That's their homestead. They've lived there for 50 years. Uh, Kevin and Marlene Young, I met them last fall uh, when I was getting these images and trying to highlight their story for some, for, uh, some folks I work with at Allegheny Front. Um, and it was unbelievable. Um, they can't leave because they can't get any money for their property. They put so much money into this property and they can't leave. And now because this gas power plant is being constructed, oh, by the way, on top of an abandoned mine, um, they have had to move so much material around to make this site viable 
that it's caused the channeling of water to go right through their property. So now for every even moderate rain event that Kevin and Marlene experienced down here, by the way, that's the highway, that's uh, the highway going north, south right there. This is uh, Byesville, Ohio, just south of Cambridge. Uh, now for even the moderate, even moderate rain events, they're experiencing huge issues with regard to flooding. Uh, they've had huge mortality in their horse, in their horses. Uh, and the other thing to mention is they've actually talked to the company. They said, look, we'll take, you know, they've given, they tried to negotiate with the company. They haven't gotten anything. Uh, we've talked to some other neighbors around this site who are now under gag order. So you can't hear from them, them anymore, but this gas power plant is kind of one of the highlight pieces of infrastructure that industry uses and many of our elected officials on both sides of the aisle use as a bridge fuel model. The fact is, is that when you do this, you create a sacrifice zone around this site. And we do not demand that these people be moved. And the way that I read it is if we're going to say that this is something that we need to do in order to have that bridge fuel or whatever the argument is for this kind of infrastructure, we need to guarantee that we can get these people out of there because you cannot have people living next to, next to a site like this. And Kevin and Marlene are an example of that. Um, this is an example um, overhead. Ted, yeah, go ahead. Can you tell them about Marlene's health a little? Yeah, sure. So, so Marlene is a, is a recent cancer sufferer, uh, survivor, um, and uh, she is now skin and bones. I mean, if you met Marlene, you would, she's a ghost. If she turned sideways, you wouldn't even know she was there. She has, the, the health impacts of this whole thing layered on top of the uh, the cancer that she's that she's impact that, that's impacted her. I mean, this this is a family. Um, they're done. They're really done. And then you have the you have the family here, right? You can see the big cranes right here. Uh, there's a family right in the shadow of those cranes that we met several years ago. Um, the 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 grandfather lives in one of the trailers next to it. And the daughter and her partner and her daughter live in another trailer just adjacent to that site. They don't leave their homes. They've had to invest huge amounts of money in air purifiers just to live. Uh, they finally did settle with the industry and now they're out. But uh, you know, this is this is what we're doing in the path of this whole thing. And we have a public utility commission in Ohio. We have a department of natural resources, and we have, as I said, elected officials on both sides that really seem to not care too much about this. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. Um, I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to show you a couple more images. Um, this is the Williamson family farm right here. Uh, this is, um, and this is a little confusing because what I'm talking about also is going to be the Williams Energy Company, but the Williamson family farm is in the foreground here. This is in Jefferson County, Ohio. Um, and what you see here is a major pipeline right of way going right through between their farm and the property just north of it. You can see the wood lot to the north there and you see that little house there with some pines to the right. Well, in between that, that house and this farm in the foreground is you see a long strip of land, or a strip of uh, grass. That's a pipeline right of way. We have a 32 inch pipeline transporting gas at high pressures and volumes adjacent to these houses. Um, and as the Williamsons, like as the Williamsons told us, you know, uh, this was their dream home. Uh, now you've got not only do you have that pipeline that I'm showing you here, running north to south, but in the for, in the distance you can see a compressor station. Compressor stations are what the industry needs to compress the gas to get it further and further downstream, so to keep the ball rolling, kind of. Um, this is a story of a family who has been. Um, harassed by the industry, has been uh, ignored by their county officials and township officials, and has basically been marginalized and told that they're making too much out of nothing. Uh, but to my reading of things, again, these pipeline right-of-ways were messing with, uh, it's a dangerous proposition. And what I would say too is, uh, some of you might be familiar with the Nexus and the Rover pipelines here in Northern Ohio. These are, um, these are gathering pipelines. So these are not federally regulated pipelines that I'm showing you here. So, so you don't have any federal oversight of this stuff. And the problem with that is, is you know, some everyone hears about these pipeline explosions that have happened across the United States. But what worries me most are the things that go unnoticed, unquantified, the kind of known unknowns as Donald Rumsfeld likes to put it. And the proximity of those known unknowns to people 
to animals in this case, and then just the environmental impact. But just living next to this, knowing that at any moment something could happen or maybe something is happening, it's just no way to live. It's no way to live. Uh, so pipeline right of ways, uh, you know, some folks along it get paid a handsome, uh, uh, handsome amount. The folks adjacent to the pipeline right of way outside of it don't get a thing. So that has caused huge divisions at the community level too. Um, you can see here's another image of the, this is that compressor station station I showed you looking due south. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, compressor station looking due south on the right there. And, and then you can see this forested ridge and on the left side is the uh, Williamson property. But whenever you have a compressor station like this, you also have a tremendous amount of pipelines being fed into it. So whenever you have this kind of what I call this charismatic infrastructure that everyone sees from a mile away, you have a ton of pipeline activity coming into that. You can kind of, it's the hub and the spokes are the pipeline. So this is another story that we've, that we've been trying to tell, that we've been trying to get journalists to tell. Uh, and we think it's a good, we think it's a good one. We also think that, um, you know, this kind of story speaks to the scale and scope of, of fracking impacts. Uh, a lot of what this family has been feeling is not just the pipelines um, that I showed you here, but it's the noise, constant humming. And then when they're, when they're blowing off gas, just because they have to keep the pressure at, at a certain level, when they're blowing that off, that involves flaring. Some of you might've seen photos of, of huge plumes of, of uh, fire. Well, that's flaring that's going on. And then when they have to vent these, these compressors or they have venting stations adjacent to here, ton of noise going on with that. And that noise issue, along with the truck tra traffic issue, seems to be the kind of running thread that I've noticed in this whole thing. Um, and I would kind of like to, um, I'd kind of like to leave you with this image. Um, this is an image of a drill rig right above Dillon Vale, Ohio, in Jeffersonville. Dillon Vale is, uh, if, you, if you blink, you might miss it. But this is a valley right here, and this is a valley surrounded by fracking. And as our good friend Yuri Gorby likes to say, when the, the conditions are right, all of the emissions from all the stuff going on around here drop down into this valley. So when there's, a, when, when there's an inversion going on, it all settles in these valleys. And we have a state and we have feds that don't do any monitoring in places like Dillon Vale, Ohio, because these are sacrifice zones. Um, and, you know, I think that this kind of build out so that you can see the drill rig in the distance, I think I have, uh, I'll leave it with this, but the drill rig in the distance, uh, I'll leave you with one more story and then I'll hand it over to Debbie, uh, with regard to drilling activity and what that means for people. Um, a friend of mine, Jill Hunkler, who's from Belmont County, Ohio, her, uh, cousin, Randy, uh, Randy Hunkler lives in the township of Belmont. And during some of the interviews that I've done, we had a chance to have about two hours with Randy in his house before COVID, obviously. Uh, and one of the things that Randy said to me was, when Gulfport was here, uh, it was three months of drilling and fracking. It was constant noise. And that was two or three, that was three years ago. I still have not gotten over that. Uh, that's the kind of thing that the noise pollution and this kind of activity, when they come in, they come in whole hog and they leave communities decimated. Uh, and they always get what they need. The fracking industry always gets what it needs, but in the process, it leaves communities divided. As you see with the city of green and the Nexus pipeline, it leaves communities just wondering what the heck just happened most often, more often than not. So I would kind of like to emphasize to everyone on, on this uh, webinar that um, I'm really grateful that you're interested in these topics. I would also like to suggest that, you know, when we think about these areas, we try not to paint too broad a brush. I know that in the aftermath of the last couple of elections, everyone has these kinds of notions about what it is we're talking about. These are amazing. A lot of these people are amazing people. Uh, I don't think they deserve to be treated this way by the industry and by our regulators. And they have their own elected officials to blame, absolutely. But we all have our officials to blame. And uh, a lot of the reason that this is happening is because we have a country and we have a region doesn't really want to come, 
wrap its head around what a transition will take and the pain that it will take. And I would just suggest, you know, my closing argument that these folks have been experiencing this pain for generations. So I think it's time that we kind of take on some of that and put some, you know, put, put our money where our mouth is. But yeah, so I, I appreciate your time and uh, I guess I'll just hand it over to Debbie at this point. Um, I, I love Ted's presentations and I love his visuals. And I, I think you should maybe, well, I, I love the picture of the Youngs. Is it the Youngs? Yeah, um, yep. Of their home and um, to have that immensity just move in next to you is, it's staggering. And you know, we may own property, but we, we can't own everything around us. And so you don't really have control over what people buy or do with their land if they're adjacent to you. Um, the health effects, one of the problems, I don't think anybody anticipated the noise issue that, that Ted brought up. And particularly people that live in the country, they live out there partly because they wanted peace and quiet and they would have bought along I-70 if they wanted constant traffic. So um, it dramatically changes their environment from why they went there. Um, in the case of um, Mrs. Young, she got lung cancer, never smoked. And it was because of the stuff that they put in the air. And Ted, do you know the specifics of when they were building that baseline, that basement, and maybe you should talk about it because I don't know the details enough, but it'll give people an example of what I'm going to talk about after that. Sure. Yeah. So, so kind of referencing that, that gas power plant uh, that I mentioned earlier, that's being built on a, uh, as I said, an abandoned mine. So they had to go in to that site and I don't have images of that. Um, but they had to go into that site and drill down a whole bunch of boreholes and shove a whole bunch of stuff down into that mine to stabilize it uh, because you had a pillar mine right underneath the site and on its face you shouldn't be building a gas power plant above a, a abandoned mine but that wasn't good enough so what we decided to do was fill in the voids and um, you know that's done a lot of stuff as far as moving subsurface water around and the like uh, and has caused a lot of instability in the site because you're basically you're basically changing the hydrology of the site and you're also just basically um you're trying to kind of put lipstick on a pig as it were uh, it's not a site that is, ever should have been approved and the corps of engineer and our state kind of just signed off so it's it's pretty pretty brutal and what did they put down there yeah, it was like a mixture of just like grout, like cement and like, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the specifics of it, but I mean, it's just a whole admixture of, of stuff that they kind of, kind of cobbled together. I mean, there was no precedent for this kind of filling in of a mine to do this on top of it. They, they filled in mines before, but not so that they could do this on top of it. Right. And then I don't think people grasp that all that white looking stuff they had to put down a surface to build this on. And I, I seem to remember you saying they used some pretty toxic things in that. Yep, yep, absolutely. And, and you know, they, I mean, hundreds of trucks coming in and out of there. And, and, and not only are they that site that they're putting that stuff down, um, but they're raising the grade all over the place. So you're creating this funnel effect that's channeling right into the, the, the Youngs, as I mentioned earlier. And they're incurring huge issues with dust uh, and they're another one of these families. I mean, a lot of these families end up just deciding either I'm going to move or I'm not leaving my home. There's no way to operate. <laughs> right. And I, you know, we think of wind as dispersing things. And when I have spoken, um, I recall one time when I spoke to a group of doctors who were really shocked and appalled at the things that I explained about fracking. But the next speaker after me got up and said, um, the solution to pollution is dilution. That is crazy and it's in, untrue. Um, you, you cannot dilute this massive of an assault on your lungs for the amount of stuff that a fracking pad puts off, that evaporating frack waste is, 
And in the case for these people, two or three years of massive dust in the air, it's not an occasional thing, it's constant. And our lungs, we basically, we know, all of us know that oxygen and car carbon dioxide are exchanged in our lungs. But what we really don't comprehend is that any gas exchanges into our lungs that we breathe. And you, it's going through one membrane. It's going through the, the membrane between the, the air sac and the bloodstream, one membrane. It is not very much protection. You have to think about um, where you put your lungs because you don't have a way to protect them unless you wear uh, significant protection like a respiratory mask that's screening the air and filtering it. Not Nothing like our little cloth masks for COVID. Um, so, and, and that's the other thing that um, when they first talked about fracking, there was a lot of noise about the water and the water is a serious issue because of the way the hydrological cycle is but the air is what takes people out initially. Because if you have 78 chemicals hitting you at once in the air, not two hours a day, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week, your body has an amazing ability to clear things, but it cannot clear that many things at once. Um, all, the data that people cite, even the EPA, most of our industrial data happened from studies of companies that used bad things like VOCs and some of the things that come up uh, around a frack well or an injection well. But those people were only exposed for 40 hours a week or maybe 45. And then they went home and had the other 128 hours a week to breathe normal, fairly normal air and not to be in close contact with that. And so their bodies had a time to recover from that. And so they tracked it and said, well, as long as the level stays under this, you're good because people don't you know, seem to be in trouble. But additionally, you have to think that in an, in an industrial environment like that, so in plants, in the 60s and 70s were primarily male workers above 20, at least above 18 years old. There weren't pregnant women and there weren't children there. So we have no idea what are the safe levels for those two populations, nor were there any elderly there because people retired at 65. So if you were 80, we don't have, we don't have any data for what's safe for you. But more importantly, in medicine, there's a, a condition called multiple chemical sensitivity. And what we've found out from studying that, it's people who've gotten really heavy exposures to something, and then their body just sort of craters and any kind of smell or any kind of chemical makes them sick. So they have trouble in a normal house that just got new carpet because that small amount of stuff coming off that carpet and the installation overwhelms their very limited ability to still clear things. It's not that their body quit working, it's that they have this huge amount of stuff from that original exposure that's probably still in their body that they're still having to offload. And it just doesn't give them room to offload another thing. And what we found with those people and in the few studies we've done with maybe three chemicals at once is that if you can have a level of 200 of each of three chemicals if you're only exposed to them one at a time. If you're exposed to them all together, you might only tolerate a level of 40 of each one without getting into overload. So in 2016, there was a great study published by Lisa McKenzie, who's a PhD from the Colorado Public uh, Health um, Department. And they found that there were 78 chemicals that came off of a well pad. Um, they did multiple well pads and they tested air for almost two years. It was a, a brilliant study. And that is really what put me on the war path because 
as I just told you about your lungs, they're pretty much undefended. Your lungs depend on you to be smart enough not to walk behind a semi truck and breathe in the fumes. They depend on you to put yourself in environments that are clean enough that they don't make you sick. And although you can smell diesel fumes, you may not smell everything that comes off a compressor station. Um, what Ted didn't have time to tell you is that a compressor station is licensed or approved for a certain amount of gases, huge amount of gases for things like hydro hydrogen sulfide, um, carbon monoxide, most of you know something about that, and various VOCs, volatile organic um, compounds. And But the, what they don't tell you is there's no meter on them to measure to make sure they don't go over that. So they say you're allowed to have this many, and then they don't check to see how much is there. And outside of a compressor station is not somewhere you want children to play or adults or elderly because the air contains a lot of stuff that you don't smell with your nose, but that's nevertheless there and is harming you. Even building pads and even operating pads where they use the frac sand that Ted mentioned, that frac sand is much smaller than the sand you picture at the ocean and it goes in and lodges in your lungs and it causes fibrosis, which is fatal and is irreversible. So if you have the bad luck to have someone build a pad next to you and you go outside into the air, you are, it's like Russian roulette with sand. You're betting that your body won't get too many and you won't get fibrosis, but you don't have any way to know. And so one of the things that I have to say as a physician is, if this comes to your area, the wisest thing is to move if you can afford it. As Ted mentioned, you're not going to be able to probably sell your house for what you paid for it, let alone make any money on it. And the problem is when they move in, they don't, they, you notice that they're there, but you don't, most of us don't make big moves until we're forced to do so. If you wait until your child has leukemia, it's a little late to be moving. The kid is still gonna to have to have treatment and that's going to, if he lives or she lives, that's going to affect them for the rest of their life because that sets them up for other things. Um, and that's the, the real human component of this is how do you convince people you need to leave? And as a physician, that would be my first and last advice is you can wait until your wife gets lung cancer, even though she's never smoked, or your children get leukemia, or you can be proactive and do something now. And I've thought about this a lot because, you know, most of us invest a significant chunk of our life to buy wherever we settle down. And so you can't recover that unless you do it rapidly. So as soon as they come in, before anybody knows anything, if you're savvy, you could sell your place then. But you're hoping that it won't be as bad as you've read. So people don't usually do that. So suppose you're a factory worker and you have the bad luck to live next to three well pads because it's not like they bring in one well pad. They bring in dozens of well pads and that's what Ted was explaining in that picture. If you live in that valley, there's you can only see one in the picture but all around them on the hills are, and then they tend to build them on the top and we live in the valleys. Um, when I lived in Oklahoma, it's hard to believe this when you're from, Oklahoma, from Ohio, but the wind always blows in Oklahoma and it's flat. So truly, even though oil and gas always gave off all this bad stuff, the wind would blow it away. So you could probably live adjacent to it and perhaps not get cancer for 20 years. But if you live adjacent to well pads, you, people are getting sick within two years, one year. It doesn't take long when you have that big of an onslaught of toxins for your body to respond, but cancer isn't always the first thing you get. Um, and so 
it, the trick is how do we convince people? How do you even get to know them and talk to them to say, hey, the best thing you can do, yes, put in air filters and air monitors, but are you gonna keep a five-year-old from going outside? I mean, probably not. And some of it gets into your house anyway. So I've also thought about what if you can't move? Well, one option would be for mothers, because mothers and children tend to take the brunt of this because they're at home, while the fathers are perhaps off somewhere part of the week working. Take your children, pack a lunch, and go to some library in another county. Well, that wouldn't have worked this past year because libraries weren't open half the year. But you almost had to become a migrant parent, take your children away from it as many days as possible. Go visit relatives in another town every weekend. Go camping every weekend. Maybe buy a camper and go live in a state park like year round or migrate from state park to state park so your children and your wife can breathe clean air. But oh, they have to live in a you know, RV in Ohio in the winter. That would be a trick. But because some people can't afford to move, but how can we make it so that their kids don't all get leukemia or their wife doesn't come down with lung cancer or something else, lung fibrosis, um, brain tumors. Uh, a lot of the problem with health around this is that the symptoms people get initially look like other things. They look like allergies or cold, except they happen in the, the wrong seasons for allergy. Uh, people get headaches. Well, if you get a headache, you don't immediately think that this is a neurological issue. It is a neurological symptom. But if you live adjacent to something like that, your brain rapidly gets overloaded with toxins and then you get headaches. Uh, people develop brain tumors. Um, you might, another neurological symptom would be just can't get out of bed, just can't do anything. You know, might get dressed and sit on the couch all day. That's because you're your brain's being affected and most likely your mitochondria, which is the energy generators in each cell are being wiped out by all these toxins, which are either using up all the, the vitamins and other compounds that keep those things functioning because they're little factories in your cells. And if you can't get rid of the byproducts, they can't work. Or if you don't get the, the building blocks they need. And if people get short of breath or wheezy around a um, well pad, you can put, give them an albuterol inhaler, but it's not going to help them because they're not re, they don't have an allergy reaction that's constricting their arterioles. They're getting holes in their lungs from the toxins. So it's very different. And it's, although it's invisible, it's affecting multiple systems. So I'm, that's just an overview. Um, and I think maybe there might be some questions and we want to have time to answer them. So let me pop back to Debbie and let her give us your questions and we'll try our best to answer them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's fascinating. Um, it's now time for questions and answers. Uh, remember to put your questions in the Q&A and use the chat um, for your name and email if you're not on our mailing list. Um, you could also use chat for comments if you like. And Laura, you asked the first question. I will, Debbie. And uh, I have several actually that are about legislation and legality. Uh, I'd like to start with one from Lori. Lori says, I'm frustrated by the dilemma of protecting oneself by leaving clearing the area so frackers can do their damage with fewer voices testifying to the damage. And she says, I'm not advocating people sacrifice themselves. I'm advocating uh, regulating this industry for safety. So I wonder if um, you would like to address that comment. Sure, I'll, I'll go first and then I'll hand it over to Debbie. Uh, I agree with you, Lori. Uh, you don't want people to not be there because then you got no one watching the hen house. So I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, 
but I do think that uh, in the examples that I've cited here, um, especially the power plant, which is going to be fall under the, you know, kind of eminent domain kind of thing, uh, it's going to happen one way or the other. I would argue that um, we need to offer something above fair market value to people. That the option has to be there to leave. Uh, you can't you can't force someone to want to sacrifice themselves or their kids just because we want people to be around to watch it. That's that's not a that's not an alternative. But I will say that um, you know we have legislators in Ohio running roughshod <laughs> uh, with regard to bills that they're passing in the name of Alec, frankly, uh, and are un for, for Alec. Um, and so, you know, it would, I think that the solution is to offer counter legis legislation to kind of, uh, uh, to, to, to counter this kind of Senate Bill 33 kind of bills or some of the infrastructure bills that people are trying to, that these kinds of folks are trying to pass. We have to offer counter legislation, come up with legislation because that's what they're doing. The industry thinks long-term, they think way long-term and we always think in the next couple of years. So we have to kind of think the way they think and the way they think is to develop bills that anticipate the next conflict. Uh, and we have to start to develop bills that anticipate that as well, but from our side. So, um, I agree with you that we do want people to stay around. Um, the population density in most of these areas isn't very high anyway. Um, but uh, at the same time, um, you know, if you had met Kevin and Marlene or Michelle, uh, the, you know, it, that's a tough sell. Uh, that they should be offered something in the name of this kind of quote unquote energy independence model that's being pushed, so. Yeah, and I want to also respond to this idea that we can legislate and regulate this. If, if we gave you a fracking 101 presentation, there is every single level is leaking. Yeah. Every single process is dumping stuff into the air that people don't tolerate. Mm -hmm. um, I first learned about this somewhere around 2009, 2010. And it takes about a year or so to get, maybe even two to get smart on fracking because most of us just aren't into that industrial stuff. We have other real lives. And it was a terrifying time for me because I realized the impact this was likely to have on human systems. And this, after about a year, I said to this young activist, because I was not an activist, you know, doctors don't have time for that stuff. And I said to her, you know, I just don't think that there's any way to make this safe with our current technology. We are just such an arrogant people that we think we know everything about everything and that we can just do whatever we want and we're right and everyone should do it our way and their opinion's not important. And that has increasingly been the way our whole society has functioned the last four to eight years. If you don't agree with somebody, you lambaste their character instead of looking at the facts. And it's this arrogance that, well, we're smart. We need this energy, so we're going to do it now. In our governments, you know, the geopolitical reasons wanting to be able to employ some people, wanting to pacify unions. I don't know what all their wondings are, but we don't have the technology to do this safely. And we aren't going to have it for another 20 years, at least, maybe a hundred. This stuff has been down there for thousands of years and we only get it once. Once you dump it, the gas we're going after now, they released so much gas when they went for oil that they didn't want to use into the atmosphere way more than we still have in all the shale on the planet. And I also lived in Oklahoma and, you know, people who work in gas and or oil were called wildcatters. Oh, so we chose the wildcatters to harvest this non-renewable resource that is in the planet. We chose people who were, you know, gamblers who have no scientific background I mean, they hire engineers to come do certain things, but as a society, this is ludicrous and crazy. And it's because we think that we're in charge of the planet and we're in charge of everything. 
And isn't there some issue with the gag orders and the, uh, what do you call it, patents, or to even find out what they were putting on the frac sand to, before they put it down into the earth, they, they wouldn't tell you what these chemicals were. So it was very hard well, to study them too and measure them. Yes. And if you get hurt, if you get dumped in it, we can't get that information in medicine right. to treat. Yeah. Um, now, and that's somewhat different state to state, but this isn't just Ohio. Mm -hmm. This is happening in all the other, we're the Johnny come lately's. It, the states out West that have had this, uh, I went to a national conference on registries before we developed the Ohio Health Registry. And they basically said, this happens in every state and it will happen in your state. And they are absolutely correct. Um, but some states like in Pennsylvania, you cannot seal information on a trial without having an open session to which the press is invited. So they were able to get around that sometimes, but the press basically pushed back. So they were able to at least get some information, but I don't think we have that rule in Ohio. So the different laws in different states affect us too, but the idea that we can make this safe, that is a fallacy. With our current technology, we can go to space, but we cannot keep pipes from leaking. And we cannot, you still have to pressurize gas to put it in a pipeline. And that means you gotta, sometimes you can't put all that pressure in and it has to go out. Mm -hmm. It's imperfect. People are building the pipes. People are installing the pipes people that have deadlines that are, there's just money pressure. It's just crazy. We might yeah. be able to do this in a hundred years, but not now. I think to, just to add on that, um, the pipeline thing is, you know, it's two, it's a two pronged attack here in Ohio. It's these gathering lines that's, that are not federally regulated that I was talking about. And then it's the transmission lines that again, the Nexus, the Rover, the Utopia, some of the ones you might've heard of, the Texas Eastern, those are transmission lines under the federal FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Now, the point to be made about FERC is uh, uh, um, Jamie Raskin, congressman from Maryland, just did a study the last bunch of years. I don't remember the year, the number of years he looked at, but he and his staff looked at FERC and they found that less than half a percent of the pipelines that came before FERC were denied. So the word proposal is, a fa is an in incorrect word. It implies that like something might not happen. FERC always passes these things. Now that's at the federal level, at the state level, we have a public utility commission that you all know about, but they have been they have been horrible in their oversight of these gathering lines. The gathering lines, counties don't even know what they're doing. They know that they when they cross underneath their right of ways, but that's about it. And so that's the point that I want to make about pipelines. The other thing I wanted to say about what Debbie said about the leaky system is so spot on. I mean, like throughout the chain of from cradle to grave, a unit of gas is just everything is leaking, but also. To that, to that end, we've seen that the industry has gotten less and less efficient in their extraction methods. So they're using more and more sand, more and more water, more and more chemicals per unit of energy that they get. So the ratio of what they need to what they get out of the ground, that ratio has gone through the roof. It's gone exponential. Mm -hmm. And when we see that happening, we know the corners are being cut. And when corners are being cut, that means more waste is being disposed of in dubious ways or just thrown to the side. So the leaky system and the inefficiencies that are growing kind of connect in that interaction and they create something that, you know, is, is worse and started off pretty bad. And if I, I want to say this before we take our next, because we've touched on it tangentially, but as we've rolled out the Ohio Health Registry, which is part of the Ohio Health Project, what we have found over five years is that it's, it's difficult people to get people to participate. And we've realized that the people who experience this have become paralyzed. Well, if, if, you, if these are the kind of questions you face every day, should I move? Are my kids gonna get cancer? It's very toxic emotionally to people. And our most recent project that we developed, um, which we initially called the Healing Circles, was to get to this emotional, social community fracturing and destruction that leaves people almost like with PTSD. What did you call it? PFSD, you know, post fracking. It's just, they're paralyzed. They, they just can't even move. It's like a depressed person gets so they can't see. 
And that the, the program we're, de we're developing is to have small groups, which will probably happen virtually, where they can share their stories and start to try to heal this so that they can move on with their lives. And this is a emotional mental health issue. And if you think we're bad at fixing environmental issues, <laughs> then think about that issue, the emotional and mental stress that they're under, in addition to all the other stress that we're all under just to try to make a living. This is the really big, I think, thing out there is how do we help people recover from having constant noise for three months or from having their kid get leukemia from this? And then if you're the neighbor that sold the land and then these darling children you've watched grow up get cancer and you know it's partly your fault. It's yeah. devastating on people and communities. And we're really excited about our program. Um, and you would think, well, that doesn't going to cost much. But if this rolls out in a big way, you need a lot of people that are willing to run the groups. Um, and so there's it's always good to have more money to do your programs um, and then to administer it. What we've found, we're an all volunteer group. We've had selected temporary people work for us. And we've found that for the follow-up for something like this, you really need to have people that work for you, that you pay money to. So it's really changed my view of working. It's like, we need volunteers that we can pay because we need them to make it a priority every week so that we can be consistent with the people we're reaching out to. Uh, um, Ted, maybe you have more to add on that. No, I mean, yeah, that was like I was saying at the outset, we got to all put equity into this. And, and instead of being against a lot of things, we got to be for things like, you know, Lake Erie Wind or some projects on the renewable front that might have environmental costs. But you know what? The human environmental cost of this being wedded to cheap coal and now cheap gas uh, is a is a generational thing. So I mean, we're going to have to pivot, and and that's going to take folks to kind of swallow hard and understand that we, you have to get in the fight on a legislative angle, but also in engaging the projects that you're running too. So, are you ready for another couple questions? Sure. <laughs> Probably have two more questions, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so um, Chris asks, are there any legal remedies for people who live right next to one of these facilities? And I'll add a couple of things here. If there are not legal remedies, why not? Does it all have to do with legislation? And is that would that be a state legislation that would create a, a situation where there could be a remedy? Um, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not going to go too far out on that, but I will say as far as the pipelines that we talked about, the transmission pipelines, those are, that's eminent domain. So that's, you've got nothing there. Uh, you're relying on FERC to kind of not, um, approve these projects. So that's, that's that. Um, as far as the transmission, uh, excuse me, the gathering pipelines that I talked about, uh, mo there's nothing there. There's nothing, basically you, you can go before the Public Utility Commission and, and plead your case. Um, but I do know that folks like Earth Justice and some other folks, Fair Shake, have been doing some good work representing these folks. So I defer to them as to the legal remedies that folks have. But Judy Berger, as the example of down in uh, St. Clairsville, her neighborhood, uh, Pickering, Pickerington Road in, in St. Clairsville, those folks exhausted all angles. I mean, they, they tried everything they could and they still got run over. So, um, you know, the, uh, Roxanne Groff, who's down in a uh, Athens County always says, you know, you have to be willing to fight and fight and fight and keep throwing money at it. Well, a lot of people just get bled dry on that one. So, you know, that's what a lot of this industry relies on is kind of the, the, the stress that it takes on people and also being able to just wait people out, you know, death by a thousand cuts, which is, but Earth Justice and Fair Shake would be a resource to, to look into. Um, this may be the last one, we'll see. Um, it, to me, this is a little bit of an elephant in the room. We 
it appears, have a president who believes in science. And he says he believes in science. He has a science commission. And um, just wondering what you think of President uh, Biden's energy goals for renewable energy um, 2050 and eliminate pollution from fossil fuel by 2035 and all those other goals that he has. How, how hopeful do you feel about this? And to what extent does it need to involve state by state by state? Mm. Uh, I'll take on Biden for a second. Um, uh, I, I mean, I, I, you know, what's the alternative? That was horrible. So, I mean, this is, this is better than that. Um, I found that US EPA, especially region five that we interact with quite a bit, you know, you saw what they did with Flint and now they abandoned they didn't pay attention to Flint. So I don't have a lot of faith in region five EPA as, a, as the overseer on that stuff here in Ohio. And um, you can hope that they get better. They have a lot of really good people, but at the end of the day, the top folks are political appointees. So that's, that's an issue. Um, I think the energy information administration and department of energy, uh, I think that we, you know, I kind of go back to Jimmy Carter's Malay speech, you know, like we need, we need an elected official who's going to re is going to level with the American people and kind of like what Debbie said about the pain and what, well, well, the two Debbie said about the pain and what I've been saying is you need a president who's willing to go out there and not get reelected, but say the right things. I think I worry that, you know, Joe Biden, you know, he's definitely a clear, clear eyed person, but is he willing to say the tough things to the American people that they need to hear, kind of like what we've been talking about today. I don't know that, the, the, you know, the, the jury's still out there, but, um, you know, they're, they're obviously, you've got some really good folks running these energy commi uh, committees in the House, in the Senate, so we can only hope for the best at, at this point, I think. Well, and I think you have to also look at, oh, so we're going to do this in 2050. Well, conveniently, that'll be long enough to let all of the fracking continue and be finished. Isn't right. that pleasant? Right. And what they're not saying is that they'll stop this. What they're not saying is that they're going to give people money to you know, buy their land at above property value so that they have a chance to restart their life somewhere cleaner. They are not saying any of that. They're doing pie in the sky in 30 years and not what we're gonna to do today that's gonna change people's lives and make up for this atrociousness that we have perpetrated on them because our mother or grandmother didn't live there, so we didn't care. Yeah. That's interesting when you say um, what can be done today if you had your way if you could legislate things the way you think would be best, what would you do? Can I just say one quick thing, Deb? Because uh, uh, I would incrementally raise the floor on the price of oil and gas. Mm. So every time it hits a number, that becomes the floor. So that 450, like we had in 2008, is something that you know we all long for. Because you know when you saw in 2008 when it hit, obviously the market collapsed too. But you know like. I think that that has to be something we talk about, these incremental floors being raised um, because you know the price at the pump is what drives everyone. That's really, I mean, I would love if everyone on this thing cared about what I said or everyone in Northeast Ohio cared about what I, they don't, no one cares about that. Mm -hmm. But when they go to the pump, they care. So if that floor could be kind of incrementally <laughs> raised, that would be great. <laughs> I just can't imagine. Well, I have, we all have at gas heaters in our houses. I don't, I can't imagine that transition to a non-gas heated house. Yeah. Well, and if really you, we're looking at a finite resource and we're not the only consumer any longer. Yeah. You know, the whole rest of the world uses it as well. Yeah. And then you have to look at soon rationing it because some of the applications that we need for medicine come from oil and gas, all the plastics that we use um, that are essential um, for dialysis, for surgeries. What about the military applications, jet fuel and rocket fuel? Some of that has to be saved for that because if you can't defend yourself, China will be happy to come in and take us over. Mm -hmm. So 
Yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, but I, I would also say that there needs to be, um, gathering lines need to be recorded. I mean, can they just march into your land and put in a, a do they not have to get any kind of permission from owners to slam a gathering line onto your land and it, people should be reimbursed and people that want to sell should be able to move. And that if we can give billions of dollars to Arab countries and other places that aren't our citizens, then we should be able to protect our own citizens and help them. And it, it's just not happening legislatively. Yeah. Can you take one medical question from Jim? I hope so. <laughs> Does smoking cessation help? They're reducing the damage that's already caused from inhaled toxins. In other words, given that that is the environment, if you smoke and you quit, or if you don't smoke, does that make it uh, easier for you to reduce the damage that's being caused? Yes, people totally underestimate how many toxins they're putting into their lungs when they smoke. There are over a hundred chemicals in cigarettes and you're doing that you know, every 20 minutes generally, if you're a smoker. So you're already putting in a hefty load that our body can't handle. And then if on top of that, you're getting 76 more toxic chemicals, and maybe you're getting a few impurities in your well water, you are just, you know, making it crazy. When I talk to people that live there, it's it's very depressing, but I say to the women, you need to stop dyeing your hair. You need to stop using nail polish and nail polish remover because you are putting chemicals directly onto your skin that you have to clear and you are making a bad situation worse. You have to learn to eat more vegetables and fruit because plants have an ability to detox that we don't have. They live in the radiation of the sun and they can't get away from it. Um, and we don't, you have to change so many things. And even then, how are you gonna counteract the massive assault that one well pad represents, let alone 20 or 40 or 75 that might be within five miles of you. And then we live in a place where the wind doesn't blow all the time and we have inversions and we all live in the valleys where the inversions go. So, well, we don't all, but the bulk of us do. So we, we lock ourselves in, an inversion locks that in. So yeah, it, it is better to quit smoking, absolutely. Uh, because that's gonna take 120 chemicals that are absolutely getting in, you're injecting them into your own lungs. That's going to help. And, and I probably shouldn't say this as a physician, but if you previously smoked, you have upregulated all your enzymes to clear. So in a way, if you smoked and you've quit, you've given your body, it's like you've pre-primed it to clear better, but it's still not going to matter because when the, the volume of contamination that comes off a compressor station or a well pad is so huge, 78 chemicals, you just cannot cope with that. And then if you're on medications, medications are hydrocarbons, the bulk of them, and so they're cleared the same way by the same four systems in your body as fracking chemicals. So bad luck for you if you have to be on eight medications because they're using the same pathways. Interesting. Do we, is that it? Do we have time for one more, Laura? Or are we pretty much at our time limit here? Uh, I think we're just about ready to go to the end of our program, Debbie, unless you have one more. Any la last comment or we just kind of go to the end here? I would just say one more thing about like solutions. Like I'm always looking at bipartisan solutions in the sense that like what, how can we bring people um, that aren't under the umbrella that we're under into the fold? And one thing I think with regard to the question about if you could, in a dream world, what could you do? I would say Things like the farm bill and uh, the the corporate, the explicit and implicit welfare that we offer up to the, you know, agricultural industrial complex as well as the energy industrial complex, pulling that out from underneath them, 
is something that we all are nodding our heads in agreement on. But I also think that like the libertarian and the Cato institutes and the those kinds of more anti corporate welfare folks we could sign on to as well. So that that's we need to highlight the corporate welfare because that is really how they're getting away with a lot of this as well. So. And Debbie, any last word on you? Well, I think that that Ted is right. We have to come up with positive things and things that people can jump on. And the biggest thing to remember is when I was early in this, there was a, um, a teacher in one in my small group in our region when we were fighting the whole idea of leasing your land. And she and I said something in a sentence. I said, well, those people such and such. And she said, Debbie, she's very direct. She said, there are two words you need to take out of your language, those people. <laughs> and that is the, the issue. Everyone who's affected by this breathes air, drinks water. These are humans. And that to me is the key. We've these are human people. It doesn't matter politically if they believe different things than us, they have a right to be alive and they have a right in this country to pursue life, liberty and, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's what we have to remember. And the more we see each other and these people that have been affected as humans, just like us that have mothers and grandmothers the more we can get our brains together with really what is fair and what is right. Thank you. Well, I want to again thank both our speakers. Um, and I want to thank our audience. You've been great as usual. Um, this program has been recorded and you can find it on the UUCC YouTube channel. But there are also links on the website. And remember, in the near future, if you're on our email list, you will be receiving a survey asking you to evaluate the forums you have listened to, and we would like your suggestions for future forums. Please fill it out. Your import is important to us and helps us plan for next year's programs, and we will return in September. Uh, please join us for today's service. It's about process theology, co-creating the world we dream of. Might be apropos for today's discussion. And you can find the link for the service on our website, UUCC Cleveland. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you.